Hello there, all you bio rock stars. So we're here today to start the first lecture on our last entire unit in this course. We're going to spend the next six lectures talking about biodiversity, really, but also about the process that leads to biodiversity. Before we go there, I think it's really important to remind ourselves of where we've been because, honestly, we have spent a great deal of time, like 18 lectures, we've spent in a really small place. We've been looking at molecules. We've been looking at cells. We've been looking at different kinds of cells and the organelles that they have inside of them. We've looked at how cells make energy, how cells make babies, how cells are used to make baby critters, how you can look at the genetic information in a cell and figure out what those little baby critters are going to look like, and ultimately why we'd even bother making baby critters in the first place. All of it leads up to our conversation about the incredible biodiversity around us and where it came from. How did we get here? It's pretty fantastic, and it's a really lovely way to uh, tie up the pieces in the class. Our overview topic is evolution. Evolution is a process. We will spend today sort of trying to define it, but um, in the next couple lectures we're going to spend more time looking at the mechanisms of evolution, like what is it and, and how does it actually work. But before we do that, I want to um, just tempt you a little bit with thinking about biodiversity. Biodiversity is seriously like the coolest part of biology because critters, I mean, you guys know me by now. You know me well enough to know that I pretty much get excited about a whole lot of stuff, but <laughs> I get so excited when I think about or look at all the different kinds of critters out there. And I have a really fast, fast, really fast, I promise, slideshow of animal diversity. And it's actually like barely even, I mean, can it, oops, can it even really count as an animal slideshow? Because um, the fact is that my, pictures that I'm going to show you are just a tiny little sliver. And I'm going to show you pictures of animal diversity, but don't forget that in the entire uh, span of all the critters on the planet, animals are just one little branch. And really, they're like a really, really little branch. Check it out. You know this already. We know that we know about eukaryotes and we've looked at lots of different kinds of eukaryotes. We know about the two kinds of prokaryotes. We have archaeans and bacteria, and these two groups of prokaryotes have incredible diversity of critters in them. They're just not quite as um, warm and fuzzy as the eukaryotes. We know eukaryotes have nuclei. We're going to do a slideshow of animal diversity. Look at this tiny little circle, one tiny little branch of this gigantic tree of eukaryotes that is animals. And we're going to get to talk about animals in detail. We're also going to talk about plants in detail. We're also going to talk about um, fungi and protists and bacteria and archaea in some detail after we discuss the concept of evolution. But this tree shows you kind of how they're all related to each other. And you can see right about here there's a root to this tree, which means somewhere back along the line all these different groups arose from one root. So, okay, seriously? Mm-hmm. Some of these you might look at them and be like, mm-mm, that's not an animal. And if you didn't, like, slice this thing open and look at its cells, you might believe that, but it is a sponge. It is the most primitive animal in our uh, slideshow here. Here's another type of sponge. It's an ocean critter. Jellyfish, total animals. Look at the diversity of this. Here's another jellyish thing. 
Here's a flatworm. Dude, these things are awesome. A whole bunch of flatworms are actually parasites. Oh, so you know I love them. What is that thing? I have no idea, but it's a critter. It's an animal. More o ocean critters. Some sort of clam-like. Look at that thing. I mean, these are beautiful ocean. Don't you want to cuddle this little cuttlefish? And it's related to this little segmented worm from the ocean. Yeah, don't mess with that thing. Here's some more little segmented worms from the ocean. This thing, are you kidding me? Like, if anyone ever finds that in a tide pooling adventure, you got to let me know because I'd love to be checking that thing out. Huh, my little favorite animal buddies. These are the moss piglets or the water bears. They're microscopic critters. These are the ones that I told you about at the beginning of the semester that you can actually freeze them or try to freeze them down to absolute zero and then thaw them out and they come back. Aren't they cute? You got some crabs. You got some millipedes. Like, look at the different kinds of critters. And all of these things are animals. So we're going to learn about all the things, like the characteristics that all of these guys have in common that make them actually qualified as animals. We're probably a little more familiar with the vertebrates. All those things before this were invertebrates. But here are um, vertebrates, and in spite of the incredible diversity, seriously, like these things are fantastic, in spite of that diversity, they have a lot in common. All of them have a vertebral column. All of them have a spinal cord running down the middle. All of them have characteristics also in common with all, like the sponges, which is why they are all classified as animals. Dude, this, oh, I could tell you a story about every single critter here, but I have to tell you about this one. This guy, little turtle man, has, see that little white thing in his mouth? Yeah, that's not like he forgot to brush his teeth. He has a little, like, tongue lure in his mouth, and he sits in the water and he opens up his mouth, and he sticks out his tongue lure? What? And then a fish is like, hmm, I feel like eating that little worm thing that's sitting down there. I'm going to go, and guess what happens? This is the master fisherman. This guy yumptualizes the fish that came down to eat the little worm thing. Incredibly effective strategy. So uh, if you see that little worm thing, don't go sticking your fingers in that hole. Snakes, of course, birds, reptiles and birds. Let's start talking about that fun stuff. That's actually super interesting, the relationship between them. Birds are like, I had to put 8,000 pictures of birds in here because look at these things. I mean, they're shocking. What's that? It's not a bird anymore. It's a pangolin. It's a mammal. And that thing, an echidna? Are you kidding me? That thing's incredible. Like, I don't know if I want to cuddle that thing, but send it out to the anthill and it can do some damage. And this is my favorite guy of all, the platypus. Dude, when the platypus was first discovered by Europeans, they killed it, of course, because that's what we do with things that we are interested in studying. So they killed the platypus and they stuffed it so that they could study it at a later date. And they sent a stuffed platypus home to all their home dogs in uh, England. And the home dogs in England opened up the box and they're like, who played the joke on us? There's no such thing as a duck beaver thing. And the people who found it are like, no, seriously, it's real. So we killed it, which makes perfect sense. Got to have an elephant in the slideshow, some little cutie patooties, and that's kind of still cutie patootie. Don't get too close or it'll spit on you. That thing, I'm not sure how cutie patootie that is, but it's still a mammal. And this one's a little tiny little antelope. And that is a little bit scary, but um, it's from the, ja I think that's a jackal, the fox having a little song and a red panda go to the Eureka Zoo and you can visit one of those. Yeah, and animals got to eat each other too. You got to, you know, we, we all got to eat. That thing that looks like you probably shouldn't piss it off, that one you can totally cuddle with it and cuddle with that and cuddle with that. I'm ready to cuddle with all these guys. Okay, we'll stop right there. 
think about everything that we looked at. And one of the main components of our next set of lectures is the fact that we can actually, I can put a label on that slideshow and say, we're going to look at a bunch of animals. And you, with the exception of maybe some of those sea critters, you actually could point them out. You know what an animal is. And we're going to start talking about how do we know? How, what, what makes something an animal? And why do all animals have traits in common that, say, plants don't have? Like, wh why is that? It has to do with relatedness. And so that's what we're going to talk about in the next little section. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, so I pulled four critters from the last slideshow. And we already know, like, every critter that we looked at in that slideshow was an animal. So we already know if we had to, like, sort these animals into groups, we know that all of them, oh, if we had to compare and contrast these critters, our compare would be, dude, they're all animals. And we, we even if we don't know how we know that or why that's true, we still have a really intuitive sense that, yeah, they are. Like, look, look at them. Yeah, they're all animals. Some of those um, ocean critters we might question, like, is that really an animal? How do we know? We'll learn how we know that those things actually were animals. But I want you to think about what, what is it? Let's try to define what it is that actually lets us know when something is related to something else. First, let me ask you this question. Who's more closely related to whom in this drawing, uh, pictures, whoever, whatever that is? You've got four critters, and if you had to sort them into two groups of who's most closely related to each other in the group, did you know what I'm even saying? Nobody does. But I'm going to tell you what the answer is. Hopefully you look at this and you're like, Riggs, seriously, this next test is going to be very easy if these are the kinds of questions you're asking because there are two birds, and the birds are more closely related to each other than they are to the gorilla and the panda. Who are more closely related to each other than they are to the birds? Does that work for you? So, but how did you know that? And let's list it out. You know that things are closely related when they actually have morphological, morphological similarities. What does that mean? Morphological. Let's have a new color to say what morphological means. The morphology of something is like its form, like its structure. So morphological similarities are actually anatomical or Think about what we just did. Anatomical, like structural, like things you can see. What word would you apply to that? I'll tell you. I hope you yelled that loud. It's the phenotypic similarities. Does that work for you? So morphological similarities or anatomical similarities between critters means that they actually have phenotypic similarities. They actually share characteristics in their phenotypes, what they look like in common, which should lead you to the next one. Because if there are phenotypic similarities, then what causes those phenotypic similarities? Come on. Please answer that question and let me know that the entire last, like, 12 lectures wasn't in vain. <laughs> if they have phenotypic similarities, what creates the phenotype? They're genotypes. Gene genetic. That says genetic. They have genetic similarities, which means, how are you going to define that? Let's go with the flow here, doggies. That means that they have genotype 
similarities. And do you agree with that? Like, think about how do you look like your mama? Because you got a bunch of her DNA. And so if you have the DNA that made her phenotype, the, then you are going to look like her. You're going to have morphological similarities to things you're more closely related to. This, to me, the way that you look like people you're related to is super intuitive. Making the leap that that must mean that you also have genetic similarities, that's not a hard leap. That's not a big leap. That's not like leaping over an ocean or trying to jump over a creek or anything like that. It's kind of, yeah, that makes sense. Remember it. We're going to talk about um, what it, like ancestry, like why your ancestors look like you, and, and we're going to think about it in kind of a visual sense. So we're going to um, build a little family tree and talk about relatedness and ancestors so that we can map this kind of stuff moving forward. Okay, I'll be right back for that. Ancestry is a concept that we're familiar with, and so I'm going to risk a pretty huge misconception. Um, evolution does not map, evolution does not happen in a generation between a parent and a child. Evolution happens at the population level of organization, and we're totally going to talk about that in way more detail. But I'm going to use, we're going to um, make evolutionary trees, and the trees are illustrations of ancestry and relatedness. And to get comfortable with the concept of the evolutionary tree, I am going to make a family tree, knowing that you guys are paying close enough attention to um, not make the huge misconception that um, our family tree that I'm about to draw you is actually the same thing as an evolutionary tree. Uh-uh. Mm. I'm making an analogy right now. What? Me? Analogies? I'm making an analogy right now, and you know what else I'm going to do? I'm going to do something epic. I'm going to start my picture on the left side. And I want you to know that I do not want to. It's a little challenging for me. I'm going to start the picture with the most recent um, people in my world, which are my kids. So we're going to have a little box for Keenan and a little box for Kai. These are my small humans. And I'm putting them in boxes. I'm putting them up at the top of my tree. And what I'm going to show you is that they actually are related to each other. Now, Am I drawing a pedigree right now? Heck no. I'm not drawing a pedigree, so do not be confused. This is an evolutionary tree. But on my tree, Kenan and Kai are my most, like, the babies out there, and they share a common ancestor. And guess who that is? Oh, you know I got to have me on the tree. I, ancestors of groups, if we're talking about, like, building a visual, a tree like this, ancestors are represented by dots, by little nodes. And critters or people who are living and in existence are all up at the top. My analogy breaks down because um, ancestors usually are not alive if you give rise to two different groups of critters, but we can talk about that, that in the next one. Um, do I have an ancestor? Like, where did I come from? Aw, don't you want to know? No, never mind. I changed my mind. Don't ask that question. But I'm going to tell you this. I came from my mom, and that she's right there, and her name is Honeykiss. Honey Kiss gets to be her own node because she's an ancestor. And guess what? Am I the only person that she gave rise to? No, 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 no. This is my brother, and we call him Wiggy. 
And so Wiggy has to be on the tree as well. Now, Wiggy has given rise to multiple small humans. He's given rise to Otis. Aw, this makes me want to go hang out with these clowns. He gave rise to Quinny Pie, and he gave rise to the bird dog, Birdie. <laughs> it makes me want to go visit them. Did Honeykiss have an ancestor? Oh, you know she had an ancestor. She had an ancestor. This is my grandma. My grandma's name was Honey. Just plain old Honey, not Honey Kiss. And she actually gave rise to my auntie. Are you following this? And my auntie is, we'll call her Auntie. And Auntie actually gave rise to two people, Molly and Katie. Ooh, and Katie actually gave rise just to Stella, and Molly gave rise to Grace and Emma. You now have all the cute humans in my family tree. Oh, <laughs> just from my mother's side. <gasps> we just drew a tree. Now, the ancestors, like I said, they usually aren't um, alive anymore. And in fact, if you looked at this tree, who's the oldest person on the tree? My honey, and my honey isn't alive anymore. So the farther down you go, like if we mapped her mom and her siblings, then we would have even farther back in the tree, longer ago ancestors, and they're not around anymore. But my honey kiss, I mean my mom, and my auntie, they're still here, and all these clowns are still here, and those crazy goofies are definitely still here. And so this is an example of how we can map relatedness. Now, do you agree that Keenan and Kai probably share characteristics with me that make them really related to each other, characteristics that maybe they don't have with Uncle Wiggy. And in fact, do you agree that probably Uncle Wiggy has some characteristics that are shared by Otis, Quinn, and Birdie that maybe we do not have? <gasps> but do you agree that Honey Kiss probably hooked us up with some characteristics that all of us have? And my Honey probably hooked us up with characteristics that everybody has. Do you see this? So you can look at your most recent common ancestor. I have to write that down. So you can look for a most recent common ancestor to determine relatedness. And do you agree that Keenan and Kai, their most recent common ancestor is me? But what if we were to say, you know what, we're going to go, we're not messing around with Keenan and Kai, they're cute and everything, but let's, who is Otis and Kai's most recent common ancestor? Do you agree that it's not me? I'm not even an ancestor of Otis. I'm related to him, but I'm not an ancestor. The most recent common ancestor shared not me, honey kiss. And look, Otis, Uncle Wiggy is not shared by Keenan, I mean Kai and Otis, but honey kiss is. Both of them go through, have honey kiss as their ancestor. So Kai and Otis share a most recent common ancestor in my mom. Now think about, okay, ready? Take a deep breath. Think about Kai. Okay, I'm going to have to go like, you know I got to get pink. I don't even know how I get over there. <gasps> Having issues with my, seriously? Okay, pink is not an option. We'll have to go with orange. We'll deal with orange. What about Stella and Keenan? Let's throw Stella and Keenan into this mix and see um, who is their most recent common ancestor. Is it me? 
not Stella's recent common ancestor. I'm not Stella's ancestor at all. It's not Katie. It's not my auntie. It's my honey. Look. Aww. As I record videos late at night and think about my family tree, I get all warm and fuzzy. And it makes it better that it's late at night. <laughs> okay. You ready for something else on these trees? Because we're not going to build family trees, although it probably would be helpful for you to sit down and, like, build one and, like, bring um, a couple of things to reality. But look, I want to show you, usually in an evolutionary tree, the people in boxes at the top, I don't know why I'm putting stars everywhere because now we have stars everywhere. But the people across the top, so I'll put a box around all the people that have boxes around them across the top. Usually the top of the tree indicates critters that are alive. Like these are critters that you could go out and find. Usually the critters toward the bottom, like ancestors actually aren't alive anymore and only living things like are up at the top. You can also, learn about time from a, an evolutionary tree. So usually we have the, the vertical, what, axis on an evolutionary tree is actually representing time, that, like the passage of time. So you can imagine that honey kiss giving rise to me and Wiggy is an event that happened longer ago than me giving rise to Kenan and Kai. Do you follow that? Perhaps this uh, analogy is a little too outside of what we're actually going to be talking about because what we're actually going to be talking about is species of critters. So let's do one with some species and, and really get in those tree thinking concepts. Now we're just going to build a tree with actual critters. So rather than having names of critters, I had to bring the pictures back because I love these pictures. And these are the pictures of the critters that we already looked at. So if I gave you this pile of critters and said, okay, sort them out, like who's related to who, you probably would be like, okay, yeah, we're get, we got to throw the mammals together and we got to throw the birds together. And do you agree with that? Like we got to kind of sort them by similarity. And that, again, is super intuitive. But the power of the tree or thinking, the tree thinking process, is that now we can come in and we can say, okay, let's, let's build in the lines and actually indicate the fact that these guys share a common ancestor. And we can even think through, like, what are some traits that that common ancestor might have? Traits that both of these guys share. Do you think the common ancestor had a white face with black eyes? It's possible. Common ancestors are hypotheses. We don't know what they actually looked like. We have a pretty darn good sense that these two critters are closely related to each other, but we don't know what the critter looked like that gave rise to both of them. And chances are pretty excellent that that critter did not have, I mean, it, that critter, that ancestor probably didn't look like a panda, probably didn't look like a gorilla. It, but there are some characteristics that it probably had, and what do you think some of those might be? How about it had hair? Definitely. Like that's a characteristic of mammals. In fact, all mammals share that characteristic. It probably had, you know these are important, memories, memory glands, milk makers, breasts, breasts that make milk. All mammals have those things. The ancestor that gave rise to these guys probably had those things. Does that make sense? Now, do you think we can do the exact same thing on the other side? We can say, okay, these guys are probably closely related to each other, and let's just think it through. Like what kind of characteristics do these guys have? 
that they share with each other. Um, we, we're going to be highly untechnical at this point, and this is practice for the kind of thing you're going to do in lab. They, um, they all have beaks. They all have feathers. They all have, um, that says feathers. They have hollow bones. They breathe in circles. Oh, my gosh, birds are so cool. They can actually inhale and exhale at the same time so that they have, like, this flow of air through their lungs that is circular, not in, out, in, out, way more efficient. Awesome. There are other things that these guys have in common with other birds. But we also said that they're all what? Well, we got a, a whole bunch of options that we could say. And, in fact, I'm going to say I'm going to put these in an all group that is um, more narrow than the all group that we were going with earlier. We did say they're all animals. Remember when we said that? And so we could say this ancestor was just an animal. It had characteristics that all animals have. But we actually know that there are some even more specific similarities with these guys. Um, not all animals have a vertebral column, vertebrae, vertebrae. Not all animals have that, but all mammals do and all birds do. So we can say that they're ancestor, the ancestor shared by both of these guys probably had vertebrae. Does that make sense how that works? It's not all, it, like I said, it's a hypothesis. We could number the um, ancestors, and then we could talk about relatedness in reference to the ancestors. So I could, again, say, name the ancestor, the most recent common ancestor shared by the gorilla and the panda. And you would be like, hello, it's Ancestor A. I could say, tell me about Ancestor A. Ancestor A, like, what do you think it looked like? Probably had hair and mammaries. Got it? What's the most recent common ancestor shared by panda and crown crane? Follow it back, follow it back. It's got to be C. What's the characteristic that that ancestor probably had? Vertebrae. That is building a tree. You can think about your um, trees and think about how closely things are related to each other. We're going to spend a lot of time with trees, doggies, so if you are feeling like your eyes are crossing, uncross them. I'm going to tell you one more thing about trees that is kind of weird. These things are called nodes nodes, and we know already that the nodes represent ancestors. And are you ready for this? Trees can rotate around nodes. So if we put gorilla and panda on this tree, it doesn't matter if we put the gorilla on the left or the panda on the left. Like, it doesn't matter. We can actually spin the tree at the node, and the relationships that are demonstrated are exactly the same. So it doesn't matter how we put them up there, and that's a really important um, piece of the puzzle. I'm going to give you a set of critters, and you have to build your own tree next. Okay, let's do it. We're back, and this time we've got a selection of critters across the top. You will notice that I got us a very lovely butterfly, a very adorable pair of small humans. What? How cute are those little clowns? And then we had to have a clownfish to go next to the clowns and a couple of whales. Your job is to build an evolutionary tree out of these critters. Even though we tend to put the most advanced and perhaps cute critters on the left side of the um, trees, that is just actually, I'm totally putting them on the left side, but normally we put them on the right side, which is, um, I hope that doesn't confuse you. <laughs> 
because I was trying to make my tree, like, I was trying to draw my picture from the left side instead of the right side. <laughs> I messed everything up. No, it's all good. It doesn't matter how you put it as long as the relationships are the same. So I'm going to throw my little cute small people up in the top left corner, and the only thing that matters is that you are going to help me decide which of these remaining three animals, they're all animals, right? Which of these remaining three animals is most closely related to those little clowns? Well, hopefully you would look at that and you'd be like, um, they are clowns and this is a clown fish, but that doesn't mean that they're most closely related. Whales are actually mammals, right? And so the mammals, the whales are more closely related to my little clown children than to the clown fish. So look at this. We could totally make a little line. Here's boys. Here's whales. And they share a most recent common ancestor. And do you agree that we could throw some things on there? Since they're both mammals, we could totally throw on there that they have mammaries and they have hair. Awesome. Because that just tells us, dude, they're mammals. And even though you might be like, I'd like the whale to go with the clownfish, or the boys to go with the clownfish, whichever you prefer. In fact, if you think about it for a while, fish do not have mammaries. They do not have hair. They are cold-blooded. They um, have gills. They've got different body setups. They don't breathe air. They breathe air, oxygen out of the water. There's a million things that are going on with fish that are very different than what are go what's going on with whales. But if you have these two choices left, all of them are animals, who are you going to put next? Boys and whales are now in a group called mammals. Who's going to go on the clade next or on the tree next? If you are thinking, dude, the fish, the clownfish, what is the characteristic that all of those guys share in common? The clownfish, the boys, and the whale, all share what in common? They do have a common ancestor. And do you agree that they're all vertebrates? They all have the vertebral column, right? Now, I've already told you that all of these guys are animals. And so we can throw the butterfly on our tree and know that there are characteristics that all animals have in common. So let's go ahead and map out um, that. I'm actually going to tell you what the characteristic is, even though it might not make a whole lot of sense right now. But this is so cool because you know all about this. All animals have a characteristic in common, and it's that they all have a blastula. And we're going to talk about this often. They all have, what is a blastula? What? Ready? During, like after fertilization, sperm, egg, join, make a what? The zygote. The zygote goes through what process? Mitosis to form like you. And we know this, like how many times did you get asked questions about the human life cycle? All animals have a similar life cycle, and one of the stages that all animals share is that they actually, sperm plus egg makes zygote. Zygote divides into a hollow ball of cells called a blastula. So the fellas up there in the top left corner, they used to be blastulas. The whales used to be blastulas. When they were in their mama's bellies, the whales were blastulas. The fish, when it was in a little fertilized egg, it had a blastula stage, and the butterfly had a blastula stage? Can you believe there's blastula butterflies? That's so cool. So the blastula is the characteristic that they all share in common. Now, who's the most recent common ancestor of the boy and the whale? Ancestor A. 
boy has ancestor A, whale has ancestor A. They, the most recent common ancestor between these guys is ancestor A. They both also share ancestor B, but it's not a recent, it's not the most recent common ancestor. They have a more recent common ancestor. And the more recent your common ancestor that you share with somebody, the more closely related you are to them. So clownfish, awesome. The clownfish shares most recent common ancestor B with both these guys. You might, oh, oh my gosh, I have to put this in into a clicker question. Who is more closely related to the clownfish, the whale or the boy? And this, look at most recent common ancestors, and you will see that, you know what? Boy and clownfish share ancestor B. Whale and clownfish share ancestor B. Do you know what that means? The whale is equally related to the clownfish as the boy is related to the clownfish. You might be like, no, dog. The whale is like, looks like a fish. It has to be more closely related. Nope, it is not. They're equally related to each other. And then there's the poor little butterfly that that ancestor was long, long ago, back when blastulas were new. And they made their first blastula, but they had that ancestor in place. How neat is that? All right, that's cool. Now I'm going to give you a cladogram example an actual tree without pictures, and we're going to analyze it um, so that you can practice. I have an example for you. This is an actual, this is what an actual tree will look like in your world, like an actual evolutionary tree. This is what they look like. Actually, I say that, and then now I'm going, well, actually, there's a whole bunch of different ways that they can look. And you can interpret all of them because you're just going to look for the nodes to determine who's most closely related to whom. But let's take a look at this thing and let's sort of analyze what it's actually telling us. I think that it's super easy to uh, be, it's like a puzzle. And so your job is to parse through the information that you're given and try and figure out relationships, and ancestry given just what you're given here. Remember that this was the whole um, time thing. I don't know how you want to say this. Is Does time go up? Like more time at the top? You'll notice that we have, let's see, five critters on this tree. Totally could have gone out and gotten you uh, some pictures of these critters so you could actually see them. Um, the, I could ask you nine million questions about this cladogram. For example, I could say, okay, who is most closely related to the moss? Who's most closely related to that moss? Push pause and go in and say, see if you can figure out who, who's most closely related to that guy? And then, uh, now that you push pause and you figured it out, I'm going to tell you you're right. Because you're going to trace back the moss and you're going to see, oh, D is a common ancestor that gave rise to the moss. And, oh, D is a common ancestor that also gave rise to the pine. So the most recent common ancestor of the moss and the pine is ancestor D. That's super easy. Can I give you a harder one? You know I can. You know you like the challenge. What about red algae and green algae? Who is the most recent common ancestor of the red algae and the green algae? Well, we got to do exactly the same thing. We're going to have to roll through. We're going to take red algae and find out where its ancestor is. We have an ancestor at B. That doesn't really mean anything. It just means that um, we have an ancestor at B. I'm missing a whole part of my palette, which is really um, finding it quite irritating. But let's go ahead and trace back green algae. Green algae has an ancestor at C. 
Is that a shared answer, ancestor with red algae? No, no, no. The most recent common ancestor between green algae and red algae is B. Do you totally agree with that? Okay, are you ready for this one? Who is more closely related, moss and pine or red algae and green algae? Now, if you just listen to that question, mosses and pines? Are you kidding me? They're not even like how could, they're both plants, awesome, but they can't be related to each other. Red algae, green algae, they're both algaes. Those are totally more closely related. Look, who of these ancestors is most recent? B is an ancestor, but look how far long ago it happened. That was way heckin' long ago. D is the most recent common, the most recent recent common ancestor, which means moss and pines shared a more recent common ancestor than red algae and green algae, even though they share the same name. Similar to um, birds and dinosaurs, really? Like birds and dinosaurs, actually birds are dinosaurs. Let's say birds and reptiles. Birds actually are reptiles and share recent common ancestors with snakes and lizards and alligators and all those reptiles, a more recent common ancestor there than they would share to like mammals. Isn't that weird? I love that so much. Okay, I feel like there were more questions that I needed to ask you. Um, I could give you, here would be another uh, extension on this problem. I could give you a trait. I could give you several traits. Okay, look, I'm going to give you trait number one, trait number two. I'm going to give you trait number three. And guess what? I'm going to give you trait number four. And then because I really love you, I'm going to give you trait number five. And then I could ask you things like, okay, what traits do green algae have? Okay, look. I want to know green algae, what traits do they have? Numbers. Do they have trait number one, green algae? No, they don't have that trait. That trait happened over here. Do they have trait number two? No. Yeah. Do they have trait number three? They totally have trait number three. Do they have trait number four? They totally have trait number four. Do they have trait number five? They totally have trait number five. Green algae have five, four, and three. Those are the traits that they have. Mosses have trait one, two, three, four, and five. Pines have traits two, three, four, and five. Do you see how, like, the traits that we throw on there show us how related things are? Everybody has trait number five. Everybody on our cladogram has trait number five, whatever it is. We will do cladograms for specific critter kinds because we want to we want to learn about the algae and we want to learn about the moss and the pine and so we actually are going to use these cladograms to help us learn about the critter and the diversity of the critter but just given a cladogram you can actually um, know a lot about those critters just by looking at this thing all right you know we're going to do a ton of these in class so if you're feeling a little bit like huh, we'll have lots of practice now, was the whole topic of this lecture evolution? And how, I mean, we haven't even mentioned evolution hardly at all. So let's go ahead and define the concept of evolution, and then we're going to do a quick little summary and talk about our lab. I mean, in a lecture entitled Evolution, does it really take seven clips before you finally get to the definition of evolution? Yes, yes it does. And that's okay. So evolution. You probably know by now that I'm actually super interested in all the tiny stuff. I love knowing how cells do what they do and how that ultimately creates what we see. And evolution represents, like the concept, the idea, the, the topic in this class represents our transition from little itty bitty things and little itty bitty processes to big picture, like 
holy crap big. Like, crazier, big, like bigger than our little brains. We can't even begin to imagine how big we're talking when we look at the overall process of evolution that has happened and given rise to such grand diversity that we see on this planet. But of course, because I love the little things, like I want to know, like, how'd that happen? How did that, like, really, how'd that happen that dinosaurs, um, a, a kind of dinosaur actually gave rise to a bird. How'd that happen? And so my first definition that I'm going to give you of evolution is very molecular, very genetic, and that, that is this. Evolution is nothing more, nothing more, than a change in allele frequency in a population over time. And there are a couple of pieces of this that probably deserve a little extra attention. I found my colors and I have pink now, so that makes me happy. And so the first thing that we have to define is this concept of allele frequency. What? Allele frequency. Well, okay, never mind. That's the second thing that we're going to deal with. The first thing we're going to deal with is the fact that evolution happens in populations. And I think we've already talked about this because it's such a huge misconception that I target it and, like, ask you 800 questions on the exam about this. Evolution does not happen in an individual. And pull your brain back to the very beginning of this class, and we talked about we actually defined a population. What is a population? It's a group of critters that can make babies. Often the population is like a species, like it's, they're all the same species, but the word species, it gets crazy if we start thinking that through. So uh, if you just consider a population as a group of critters that can make babies with each other, then you're, you're good because populations are what actually evolve. Individual critters or people do not evolve. Populations evolve when their allele frequency changes. So visualize this for just a second. Think about our class. Imagine that we considered a trait like tongue rolling, like that. And we imagined, okay, I can't remember what alleles we use, but we have maybe big R and little r, and big R is the dominant rolling trait, I mean allele, and little r is the recessive non-rolling trait, mm, 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 like that. Now, we should totally do this in class. We could calculate the allele frequency in our class. I'm so going to do it. I got to make a note to myself that I'm going to make a clicker question like right now so that we can do this in class. So I have, I'm, I'm a roller, obviously, and I have um, a kid who is a non-roller, and so I actually had to have a little R to donate to him, but I'm a roller, which means that I also have to have a big R to enable me to roll, right? So I'm a heterozygote, zygote, I'm heterozygous. What? I'm heterozygous. Got it. That means I'm donating one big R and one little r to the population. Let's look at my little kid who cannot roll his tongue. We're going to say that he is little r, little r, because he has to be. Now, if he and I were a population, we could calculate our allele frequency. All we'd have to do is say, hey, we have four total alleles. One out of four are big R, which is what, 25 percent? And three out of four are little r, which is 75 percent. Now, someone came into our house and was like, um, if you can't roll your tongue, you're out of the population, then that would be extremely traumatic for me, and I really don't like thinking about that analogy. It was quite horrible. But if that happened, 
Bye-bye, little r. Huh. Then there's going to be my allele frequency just changed in my population. Are you good with that? I mean, hopefully you're not good with that at all because it's quite horrifying. But the allele frequency changed in the population. Evolution occurred. This is specifically known as microevolution. And microevolution is that simple. You end up with a change in allele frequency in your population over time. Now, changes happen all the time, and changes can be totally random, and we're going to talk about different mechanisms for microevolution, like how it actually happens. If microevolution happens enough and a population experiences reproductive isolation, I have to write it down. That says reproductive isolation. Then you can have something known as macroevolution. Evolution. Okay, ready? Macroevolution takes place if a population with a whole bunch more than two people, so I can't give you, I can't draw you pictures. You have a big old population, and let's say the population splits. Like a mountain range comes up in the middle of the population, and half of them are on this side and half of them are on this side. That's reproductive isolation. Those guys aren't going to make babies with each other anymore. However, they're totally going to have their own allele frequency dynamics in their own populations. They've been reproductively isolated, and they're changing. Microevolution is happening in their population. That can lead to speciation, the formation of a new species. Um, let's put reproductive isolation and microevolution equals speciation or macroevolution. Speciation, the formation of a new species. It's not um, directed, and it's not uh, like they all sit down. You know they do this. They all sit down and go, you know, I think it would be a good time for us to uh, form a new species. You know, these guys, like, we don't really want to be associated with them anymore. They, all right, that analogy just died. But the point is that this, if you have these characteristics, you can make new species. Ready? Don't forget this part because it becomes sort of like, no, that's not possible unless you remember. <laughs> I had to pick the right color. This piece. It's over time. And we're not talking over a couple years, although microevolution totally happens in populations in, like, observable generations. Like, we can totally see it happening in a population. But macroevolution is like, Jillions and jillions and jillions of years for it to happen. I think that's all I have to tell you. And what was I going to go do? Oh, I was going to go make a clicker question so that we can count up our allele frequency. Let's do it. Okay, I'm going to go do that right now. If I can find my place to push pause. Bye-bye. Now I have a clicker question where we get to calculate our allele frequency in class. Oh, yeah. So I just wanted to summarize this conversation by kind of giving you a little bit of a heads up about where we're headed next. We're going to do, we're going to spend an entire day on the mechanisms of evolution. And so we're going to go into more detail in both microevolution and macroevolution and how exactly that happens. And there are some pretty awesome mechanisms involved, one of which, is natural selection, and that's actually the topic of our entire lab activity uh, in the following week. We also are going to spend an entire day talking about the evidence for evolution and the kinds of um, studies, research, 
um, findings that provide support for this process and that this actually does happen and has happened over the entire course of life. Now, it's really important that, uh, that I, I actually, I feel like I already said this, but I can't remember, so I'm going to say it again. The fact is that evolution is a scientific process and it is supported by evidence, and we're going to talk about all that, and there's mechanisms that totally make sense. Evolution is not the origin of life. There is mad research happening. People are super interested in where did it start, which is super legit. I mean, I'm curious about that too, but we don't even talk about that. We don't look into the leading theories in that region, like what the research is saying, what it's pointing to. Like, we're not, no, we're, we've got, this is enough. We've got lots of work to do talking about how it happens and the evidence that supports that, yes, indeed, it, it happens. But I really hope that this, uh, for me, evolution and faith are not uh, mutually exclusive. Like, I don't know, did I just say that right? Basically, you can have both. That's what I meant to say, so I don't know what I just said, but they're different things. So the process of science gives us this evidence that we can look at and analyze and talk about and be interested in and learn about, and it's different than faith, which is really important for lots of human beings. And I hope that there isn't a block in there for you because the part that we're going to talk about in this class um, doesn't mean that you don't get to also have faith or that um, we don't also have faith. The last thing I want to do today, tonight, right now, is talk about the lab that's coming up. We're going to do a tree thinking lab, and I just want to kind of roll through, like, my vision of what you are going to get out of doing that lab. I be right back. So today's lab experiment or this week's lab experiment or activity is 100% geared toward helping you think through relatedness. And classification is something that humans are like, dude, we love classifying things, often to our uh, detriment, but we definitely like to take things and let's put them in piles and these guys all have this label and these guys all have this label. And classifying critters, we're good at that. We do it a lot and often the classifications that we come up with also represent evolutionary relationships. So I want you, we're going to, this first activity is about um, building keys that we use to identify critters. And the key that you're going to build is a dichotomous key. See that word down there? That says dichotomous key. And a dichotomous key is the kind of key where you go through and you, like, look at, okay, you ask, you ask a question and you have two possible routes to an answer. You'll totally figure it out. You're going to have a set of critters and you're going to build a dichotomous key for those critters, thinking about what do they have in common with each other and what characteristics distinguish them from each other. After you build your key, you're also going to build a tree that shows how those critters that you built the key for are actually related to each other. And that's the next piece that, like, you're going to practice your tree thinking skills. The other thing that you're going to do, um, yeah, 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 you're going to do that. You have a whole section that is just uh, working on trees. And, and working on trees, you're going to learn about a set of critters by working on the tree. And that will be a good practice. So you're thinking about your trees and that's awesome, good practice. And then the last thing you're going to do is you're going to have a group of critters that look like this and you're going to build a cladogram for those critters, identifying characteristics that might put them in groups and possibly even ancestors that you might have. 
<coughs> I just wanted you to see that the lab activity is tightly related to the conversation that we had. It's um, you will get out of the lab activity what you put into it, but today's topic is truly foundational for the next five lectures, not just the ones on evolution, but also the ones on diversity and, and the different kinds of critters that we're going to be looking at. So please be disciplined in lab and make sure that you are uh, rocking the easy. I, doggy pounds, been awesome. Holla at ya later.